Nation. Tonight at 9 o'clock here on Carlton Bramwell. Now, here's Jonathan Dimbleby. Three nights from now, I'll be here with the ITV team to bring you the results of Election 97. But tonight, it's the climax of our special series of programmes with voters from key marginal seats around the country. We go straight over now to Sue Lawley for the ITV 500 and the Leaders Special. Tonight, with only two full days to go to polling day, the ITV 500 is in London for the last of our programmes that have followed the campaign trail around the country. With me, the audiences who, in their four different weather vane seats, have challenged leading politicians on the crucial issues. This evening, they're united to cross-question the three main party leaders. Well, almost. In the case of the Conservatives, I'm afraid we learned in the past few days that John Major would not be joining us tonight. Instead, we, ha instead we have the Deputy Prime Minister, Michael Heseltine, with whom we should be beginning, and he'll be followed by Paddy Ashton and then Tony Blair. So let's begin with our first question, and that comes from uh, Rick so, Medlock. Oh, wait, from I, well, I, well, well, no, I, I think, think we, must, we, cannot, we cannot allow the fact that the Prime Minister's been in Northern Ireland and couldn't announce his programme uh, because of security reasons. But he's been in uh, other well, parts you, of the country. If you think that the Prime Minister going to Northern Ireland is chicken, you haven't the first idea what a brave and courageous man is all about. Yeah. <laughs> I won't, won't take much longer, but I have to say he was in Northern Ireland this morning and this programme is taking and, place but in the late also, afternoon. He is also visiting every other part of the United Kingdom yes, because that is the big issue of the day. Okay. The, all right. The main... right. Let's, take, let's take our first question. That comes from Rick Medlock. Mr. Yeah. Medlock. Hello, Mr. Hesseltine. Um, you claim, or the Tories do, that Britain is booming. Yeah. But the reality in the real world is that it's not really like that at all. We have thousands of people living on the streets. We've got high unemployment. We've got kids living in poverty. And those back at work, the people do manage to get a job, are on short-term contracts with no security whatsoever. So basically, you stop communists, eh? You've been communist for, for the last 18 years. How do you answer that? Well, it is curious that you should think that we've been able to con the British people for 18 years when the British people have elected the Conservatives four times during the period of that time. Well, but you said 18 years. I'm merely making the point that the British people have been satisfied enough to elect us four times in those 18 years, and I think we'll do so again. Now, you've put what I happen to believe. I happen to believe well, what you... Well, answer my question. Just, 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 just to be fair. If, if I could just have a chance to answer your question, I'm very happy. That's why I'm here. Uh, the fact is that, uh, that what you've described this country, the way you've described this country, is a travesty of the truth. <laughs> this, that, if, well, thank you very well, much. No, no, yeah, well, I'm glad I've persuaded you so quickly. Thank you. The, the, fact is, the fact is that if you compare this country with the rest of Western Europe, we've got more of our people at work than any other European country. We've got an economy which is you've growing. We've got people in short time we, employment, we, is what we, you've got. We have got, we've got more uh, people at work, as I say. Uh, we've got an economy which is growing faster than any other of the Western European economies. And the forecasts are better for this country's economy as measured by the international statistics, uh, uh, economists. Yes? May oh, I just yes, interrupt you there and just say that what seems to be wh where the gulf is, is between what you perceive to be the reality and what the experience exactly. is of these people. Yeah. <laughs> This is, something, this is something that they've been giving voice to for, you know, throughout this campaign, yes, and it's but, always but look, the same. Let us not have any illusions. And this audience is carefully selected to represent the political parties, and I, I, that's what it should be. And exactly. so that means that on any normal statistics, about two-thirds of this audience want a Liberal or Labour candidate to win. So they will cheer anything that supports that side of the argument. The idea is this is yeah. a representative audience who, is, are going to, who have got a detached it is view. A cross -representative it's representative I'm audience. saying that's exactly it what is, I'm saying. It is it's an audience which is bound to give an anti-government slant. So I hope everybody at home will understand no, no, that. No, no, no. Of course it is. 
Of course it is. It is a scientifically is. selected audience it, of it marginal constituents. It is a scientifically selected audience to give a representation of the present political system in this country, which would mean that the government cannot have a majority in an audience of this sort. That's all I'm saying. Well, we've the, taken into consideration socio-economic factors and all the rest. I think you should be getting as fair a hearing as, as scientifically you deserve. Let me have that lady there. Yeah. I've always voted Tory, but I certainly won't this time. You say that England is booming. The feel, the feel good factor, but for who? The fat cats. Not the people in the streets on low pay. Managers getting 6.2% pay rises. Me, a nurse, getting 2 or 3%. People on pensions, you cut a penny off tax. If they don't pay tax, they don't get anything. It's not fair. And what is interesting is whether you think that some government should intervene in order to control the level of incomes. Uh, that's what the impression you're giving is. The fact is that we've got inflation down, which means that incomes, by and large, are rising less quickly. But the, the average earnings, the average earnings today are rising way ahead of inflation, something about double the rate of inflation for the, for the average. For the av it's, no use, it's no use shouting if you don't like the truth. The fact is the average earnings... The the average earnings are rising faster than inflation. That's why living standards are rising. That's why the housing market is booming. That's why retail sales are rising. Is because people are better off. Right. Okay. Right. I'm going to... No, hang on. Hang on. Because we want to get through quite a few subjects. I'm going to move on to education. I'm going to ask Pat Scott, who is a prison visitor, I'm told, from Coventry. Pat Scott, your question, please. Hello. Yes. My question is that I was an 11-plus failure, and I've lived with this label for the rest of my life. Um, my husband, who was brought up in a London council estate, went to a grammar school, went on to university, had a me much better quality of education than I received. Is the creation of grammar schools in every town going to create better opportunities for fewer or more opportunities for more? Well, what it does is to provide parents with choice. And it does then have the following consequence that people see what standards can be achieved. The existence of grammar schools is a major incentive to other schools to achieve the same standards. And if you actually look at one of the most serious social deprivations of recent time, in my view, I'm talking about inner cities now, people destroyed the grammar schools hoping that by creating comprehensives you would get a socially engineered society. The truth is, parents who could afford to move out of the inner cities moved to the comprehensives in the suburbs, leaving a vicious circle of declining educational standards in the inner cities. That's why Tony Blair's had to take his child out of Islington, because the standards are so bad. And, and you think, if the Labour Party had the first idea what to do about education, they run our education authorities, Tony Blair would have called... Tony Blair would have called in the Islington councillors and said, you're in charge, you raise the standards. But he didn't. He took his own child away, exercising a choice. He now prepares to deny the rest of our country. But if Mrs. David, Scott's point if is... David if David Blunkett have... had the first idea how to improve education standards, he would have done it in Sheffield when he ran the local education authority. But with respect, with respect you're not answering the two-tier question, which is the point that if you create a yeah. grammar school in every town, you can therefore create a secondary modern, as it were, in No, every you town. don't. You have comprehensive as we have got, for example, on the Wirral, which is, uh, and many other parts the of the country. But the children feel rejected, the, is No, the I'm sorry, that is, that is not the point I'm being asked. The point I'm being asked is, do you have to have a secondary modern school if you have grammar? And you don't. There are all over this country, there are grammar schools coexisting co alongside comprehensive schools. But what is important, and this is, this is the essential achievement of this government in education, is that now, because we've put parents and teachers in charge, because we've made them take examinations at, at 7, 11 and 14 and publish the results, parents can exercise an influence on the quality of education. Right. And that is why the examination results are going up. I'm going to change the subject I again. bet. I'm not surprised. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I don't blame you. Well, there was, there, there's plenty, plenty more to ask you, but not the time to do it in. Terry Hopton, your question, please. In, in your uh, last election, victory, you promised that you wouldn't put up taxes. Yeah. In that time, we've had 22 tax rises. Yeah. And what tax rises can we expect if you are elected again? Yeah. 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 On children's clothes, yeah. the loss of mortgage relief? Yeah. Or can you we trust yes? you to no, keep no, your no, word? No, I'm really sad. 
I, 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 should, I should say at once that I have recognized and understood the question. That is what I, that is what I was doing. And, and why, why don't you, because you, I'm sure you're a fair-minded guy, why didn't you mention the 25 tax reductions? Where? Because where? that is, you see that? Where? Where? That is, well, I, because people, people who are saying where, I will tell you where, 23p in the pound standard rate just a few days ago. Oh, um, yes, 7, million, 7 million of our citizens now paying 20p in the pound. That is an example of taxes coming down, but I want to go back. No, I want to go back because you've raised an absolutely critical issue in this election campaign. When we were elected in 1992, the fact is the world was going through one of the longest and most deep recessions of any ex person in this room's experience. Well, hang on, that, hang that, on. No, uh, no, let no, me... No, 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 don't give us too long a lecture, because we haven't got a lot of time. No, but, 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 just but, let's hear him look, out for a second. Look, if this... If, just a minute, sorry, if, just a minute. If this election is to mean anything, we must be able to deal with the issues. Now, you've raised one of the most important issues in this campaign. I want to deal with it head on. The well, the yeah, well, hang on. <laughs> It's quite difficult to answer the question when people are shouting at you and drowning right. out the answers. The fact is that facing, 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 facing that recession, we found that tax revenues were lower because there were less people employed and profits and companies were lower, but the bills were rising because we had more people unemployed. And so we had to decide what to do. Were we prepared to cut the central public services like education, the health, or unemployment benefit, or whatever it was? And we weren't. And so we said we would have to ask those who could afford it to pay more in tax. And I am proud of the fact that we did that at that but time. Mr. We were not prepared to let the essential public services go, and Mr. we therefore asked people Mr. to pay Mr. more in tax. <laughs> but, but now that the economy is recovering, taxes are coming down because we believe that it is right to share with the people who made the prosperity the profits of that responsibility. But surely the bottom line is that you've eroded the nation's trust. That, that you promised them no tax rises. Well, now, and look, and together, yeah. together with the shenanigans over yeah. the ERM in 1992, they no you, longer I, feel the economy I can, is safe I can in your tell hands. you that if we had cut essential public services at that time under the pressure of recession, we wouldn't deserve to be re-elected today. It is, because, <laughs> it is because we were not prepared to let the pensioners and the health service and the school kids suffer that we asked... We were not. We were not. We were not. And I tell you, well, it's all very well for you to shout rubbish. The fact of the matter is, why is it, if you think our economic policies are so wrong, that Tony Blair is committed to the same levels of expenditure that we've got? Why is that? Because he knows we've got a booming economy and that the Tories have got it right. That's why. I'm going to call a question from Phil Edwards, who's a roofer from Exeter. Mr Edwards. Moiko, what Hi. I would like to know is, um, if there was a serious allegation against someone like a doctor, he would be suspended until an inquiry, an inquiry was held. How come, in the case of your government, like people like Mr um, Miller? Mr Hamilton? No, sorry, Mr Hamilton. Yes. My mistake. Mr Hamilton, he was still allowed to run for election as a candidate, and the, the inquiry hasn't been produced to the public to this day. Why wasn't he suspended, Mr Hamilton? You'd have liked to have had him suspended, wouldn't you? Well, let me just... Let, let, <laughs> If, if you remember, there were allegations against a significant number of members of Parliament at that time. And just before Parliament rose, Sir Gordon Downey produced a report saying that um, a dozen of them or something, he'd examined the allegations and he dismissed them. On the assumption that your question is valid, all of those people would have had to have been suspended when the first allegations were made. And frankly, frankly, no, 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 sorry, let me, this is very important stuff. The fact is that allegations could be made about any of you at any time in any job you're in. And it is a fundamental and cardinal principle of British justice is that you're innocent until you're proved guilty. But, and that, but, that, but that, Mr. Is, Hamilton, that Mr. is the Hamilton. essence of the reason why the local people in the Tatton constituency have decided to give Mr. Hamilton the benefit of the doubt. But he's admitted, he's admitted tax evasion. That's no, illegal, no, isn't it? No, these, these, these... <laughs> Mr. Hamilton, Mr. Hamilton has said 
time and time again that he has a complete answer to these allegations. In those circumstances, what, I tell you, what you are doing, you imagine any of you in the situation that he's in, and what you would find is you would protest your innocence, and then a sort of hanging jury of the British media would say, oh, well, you should be well, suspended because media. you're guilty. I mean, people, That's what you would do. None of, of you would appreciate being treated in the way you're suggesting that Neil Hamilton should be treated. A quick comeback, Mr. Edwards, and then I must move on. Michael, if that's the case, then before the election was called for, why didn't the government just wait for, say, two weeks until the report come out to the public, yeah. was given to the public, yeah. and then it would have cut down the election, for, actually, for about for, four for, weeks, yes. which would have been a lot better on the because, likes of us? Because we had no idea when the report would come. Sir Gordon, Downey, well, why didn't Sir, you Gordon, call it? Sir Gordon Downey has never said when he's going to report. He's totally independent. And the fact is that even when he does report, it is a select committee of the House of Commons, all party, that actually will consider the matter and reach a judgment. Not okay. Sir Gordon Downey. Okay, David uh, Chappell, Dave Chappell, he's a firefighter from Exeter. Yes, Mr Hasselstein, you keep saying we have to wait and see about going into the single European currency. Yeah. But surely the issue is clear now. You either believe that we should be politically independent or that we should integrate economically and lose what political sovereignty goes with that. It, surely it's clear. You see, as far as I can see, under your government stewardship, we've got the worst of both possible worlds. Not only do you keep saying that you want to maintain Britain's sovereignty, but you've been dragging us further and further in. You cost us £10 billion by going into the exchange rate mechanism disastrously. And at the same time, with the message that you're sending, not only to Europe, but also to the people in the financial world, is take the money and run. So Billions things... more have gone out of the country <coughs> yeah. while we've been in Europe than have actually come but in. But the question is, why doesn't he say what he really wants, why doesn't the party say what it really wants to do rather than this wait and yes. see policy? Mm. Right. Well, the, there are arguments both ways and there are opportunities in Europe, there are dangers in Europe and we believe that it is right that the issues should be clear before we take a decision. But we have to remain at the conference table where these matters are being dealt with because whether we're in or we're out, they will affect British interests. So we are negotiating, and when we see the facts, whether they go ahead, the terms on which they go ahead, we will recommend one way or the other. Mr. But, but if we say we do recommend, then there will be a referendum of the British people. So as John Major said the other night, that he cannot take us into a single currency. Only you, exercising the, re the right to a referendum, could do that. And, and just to help you on your way, as you'll appreciate, that is exactly the same position that the Labour Party are offering, except that they will, asset, they will sell out Britain's essential interest on the social chapter and bring the job-destroying policy in Europe to this country. Oh, yes. I oh, apologise, yes. Mr Chappell, oh, but we've got so little time left. I must just ask Evelyn Wake, because I think we need one more question, and I think she wants to ask oh. about pensions. Yes. Uh, Mr Hefflepine. Our pensions went up in April, as you should know. Yes. It went up to £62.45 as a basic pension for a man, yes. and it's 30, just over £37 for the, for the wife. I'm the wife. Yes. Uh, could you manage on that? Well, uh, you do, of course, realise that no old age pensioner has to manage on just the old age pension. Uh, no, they don't. They don't. No, they don't. There is council, ha uh, uh, council tax benefit, there's housing benefit, uh, there's support, and the fact is, as you will know, everybody knows, depending upon their age and their circumstances, there are a range of health service benefits. So the fact is, there are various ways in which those incomes are supplemented. But the one thing I must actually Last deal with, that the Conservatives guarantee the old age pension will continue and will be indexed against price increases right on into the future. Right. And it is a lie that Tony Blair is putting about that there's a risk to the pension. Mr Hesseltine, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tony Blair, but in a few moments, Paddy Ashdown faces the ITV 500. Join us after the break. With us now in the studio is Paddy Ashdown, fighting his second general election as leader of the Liberal Democrats. 
poised to be his first inquisitor is Ed Hamer, who is a first-time voter and a theatre usher from Bury. Hi, um, as a first-time voter, as Sue's just said, my main concern is the election of a new government. I'm swaying towards voting for the Liberal Democrats at the moment. However, like thousands, I feel that I'll be splitting the opposition votes. What is your honest opinion on tactical voting? Vote for what you believe in. That's not his question. Well, <laughs> he's, asking me, I, I, he's asking me how he should vote, I presume. And, you know, if you always vote for second best, then don't be surprised that second best is what no, you get. No, I, I asked you about tactical voting. Fine. Vote for what you want for yourself. If, for you, the most important thing, Ed, is to remove this government, then you must vote for the party most likely to do that, if that's the most important thing for you. Yeah. If the so most you should vote for Labour. Can we just so, be so clear? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know what the most important thing for him is. If the most important thing for you as a student is investing in education, voting for Labour will change the nameplate on number 10, but provide no more money for education, no more money for the health service. It's up to you to decide what is the most important thing for you to achieve. I what? didn't say I was a student. Um, <laughs> I beg your pardon, I thought, yeah, I thought no, you, you said you were... That. No, I'm not a student, but... If, are you saying then that I should use tactical voting? You are. But is you your main motive to get the Tories out? My main, my main motive is to if, elect a new if, government to get the Tories out. If your right. main motive, if what you want to do is to remove the Conservative government, you vote for the party most likely to do that. Okay. I believe that uh, what, what I would like people to do around this country is vote for the things that they believe in. And but if they, they can't are, do both. Well, of course you can do both. If you are, if you are, in, a, if you are in a seat where the Liberal Democrats, and I've been visiting many of them, Sure. today are the challengers to the Tories, 180 of those. If the Tories are to be beaten, it's only in those seats that you beat them. You can vote at the one hand to get rid of the government and for the things you want, for investment in, like, just for investment plain, in education. If you're in a seat where Labour is the second party and you want the Tories out, so the Tories I are know, the first party, then you have to, so, you're saying vote for Labour, so are I'm you? saying vote for the, the cast of vote that is most effective for you. If you want, if your priority for you and your family is getting rid of this government. That comes before investment in education, before in the health, uh, uh, investment in the health service. You vote to achieve that. Is that clear, Ed? Yeah. Do you know what you're doing? I'm, uh, yeah, I know right. where my vote's going. Philip Savile. Philip, yeah. Paddy, Paddy Ashdown, I'd like to ask you, in, you're publicly perceived as being the trusted most of the three parties. However, you've got to face reality that you lead an unelectable party and is a vote for the Liberal Democrats a wasted vote? Well, here you are, you see. You see, the point is this that you have to address, is what's a wasted vote? If you change the nameplate on number 10 Downing Street, Philip, um, from Conservative to Labour, but that doesn't invest any more in education, that doesn't save the teacher's job as being sacked, that doesn't provide you with money in the health service, and Labour is committed not to spending any more in education or health, in other words, that they have got the same spending policies as the Conservatives, that I would argue to you, that's the wasted vote. It's the wasted vote because it changes the government and it changes the title of the government, but it does nothing for your child yeah, and nothing for your health service. Go back. Yes, but the, the whole point of the matter is, Labour learnt to their cost at the last election, the, men the first mention of tax increases allows you the election. But but You've it got isn't, to find other ways. It isn't. It isn't we want the, I want the Tories out as much as anyone, but the only real way, I, the only vote is a Labour vote to get the Tories Philip, out. Philip, you what, will not leave right. the government. You won't form the government. Well, let's leave that to the electorate to decide. You know, you won't. Right, but Philip, realistically, you can't. <laughs> You've had an election run by the spin doctors. Do not now allow a result to be taken over by the press. It's your vote, it's in the ballot box, you cast it for what you want. And if you don't cast it for what you want, you will never get that. Do you and the real problem for Philip... <laughs> the real problem for Philip... <laughs> Philip, you can, you can always vote for second best, if that's what you want. Okay. Then you'll always get second best. Janice that's Davis, the outcome. Let's have your question. Mr Astown. With only two days to go, hasn't the time come for you to be realistic about your expectations and recognise that the best possible outcome for you would be a Labour minority government where you hold the balance of power? I don't now, believe... If, sorry. You quite oh, okay. like that, wouldn't you? If this happens on Thursday as the outcome... What would your conditions be for supporting Tony Blair? No, Janice. The best outcome would be 
the largest number of Liberal Democrats in the next Parliament fighting for the things that only the Liberal Democrats but stand for. But you're not for. suggesting now, you'll form a government. Well, hang on, hang on. Uh, let me just see if I can answer Janice directly without, perhaps, uh, with the very best will in the world, you interrupting well, we, me. Yeah. I want to, I want to, uh, I, I want, want to I say... I want to get you to no, answer, well, so, no, I'm, I'm answering Janice absolutely directly. The best outcome is the maximum number of Liberal Democrats. Now, you, you Janice, suggest that the, my best outcome is a hung Parliament. How do I ask you lot to vote for a hung Parliament? You go into the ballot box, you have one vote, you can't vote for a hung parliament. A, vote, a hung parliament is a statistical... that's what happens, I'm asking you, what time. are your conditions? Look, if, if you lot, if the British electorate decide to, and you may be wise, not to give any of us power, not to give any of us absolute power, then what you are saying to us, get your act together and work together and find out what you can agree on. Then I have to amend and I have to compromise, and so does Mr. Blair. Right, so and so does Mr. Blair. What are your conditions? You haven't actually answered well, take the, a look the second in, take part a... of my. You haven't actually answered the second part of my question, Fine. which well, was. I'm going to. Which was what are the conditions? But take a look at our manifesto. So you They're would, you would want Tony Blair to do to carry out your manifesto. Janice, you, you remember what your question was? Your question yeah. was a hung parliament. She I was. don't have I don't have the authority to carry my manifesto out. Mr. Blair wouldn't have the authority if that was what you voted to carry his out. We would have to compromise, both of us. Um, so what, what issues would you compromise on, well, please? Well, you'll have to wait until after the election. Ah. Hang on, hang on, hang on. That, but Janice, but, Janice that, that, I, can't, I can't negotiate now with another party if this happens. My view is it is exceedingly unlikely to happen. But under but those also, circumstances... You've already said during this election campaigning that you would be prepared more to go towards Labour no. because you have campaigned no. quite honestly that you would actually want the Conservatives out. So that, in my mind, rules out you wanting to go towards the Conservatives. No. So what are your conditions? What are you going to compromise on, which is the word that you used, with Tony Blair? Just I'll give you two sentences, because she's tried hard, but well, she hasn't got an answer. The, well, the, <laughs> the things that we stand on are the things that we would want to see in the next government. Investment in education, investment in the health service, 3,000 more police on the beat, cleaning up our political system. Now, those are the primary things that we're talking about. If you do not give any party power after, the, after Thursday, then each of us has to come together and find out how we can provide stable government in this country on the basis of the votes that you've given us. Would you support, we a, minor tell. Would you support a minority Tory government? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and now, I'll give you one sentence. And now, and now let me explain to you, and now let me well, explain to you why. If after 18 quickly. years of this government, 18 years of failure, of exhaustion, run out of ideas, they've achieved some good things, but they now need to go. This government does not receive a majority of the votes of this country. They should not be allowed okay. to continue Mark to govern. Robinson, it's time for them to sort out their problems in opposition. Here he is. Mr Ashdown, um, I'm a romantic idealist, um, <laughs> yet even I find it difficult to believe you'd be able to carry out all of the things you're proposing in your manifesto. Um, the other parties seem concerned not to promise anything that they can't actually um, achieve, and therefore they're promising very little. Um, why do you think you can pro uh, provide so much for the country? Mark, well, the other parties, neither of them, have done what we have done. Those are our promises, that's what we ask you to vote on. That's what we ask you to give us the power to put into practice, and if we have to negotiate with other parties, no, I think it's exceedingly unlikely that's the basis we'll do it. What makes that deliverable is this. That is the only party that has produced the menu of promises and the costs. And let me tell you, for six weeks in this campaign, both other parties have tried to knock those costs down. They have not been able to do so. Neither of them has said, this is what we'll do, and that's how much it will cost. One of the reasons why we have to ask you for a penny on income tax is because the £2 billion we want to invest in education can only be delivered if we ask that. Labour and the Conservatives, both of them agree on one thing. They're making two impossible promises to you. They can, in the present circumstances, cut taxes and maintain public services. It can't be done. I won't make those promises, and that's the proof of it. Was there some cynicism in, what you, in your question, would I to take? Um, yes, I mean, I, I'd be glad if that actually happened, but I, I do feel that you might be proposing these things because you know you won't actually have to put them in practice. Oh. On the contrary. Well, Mark, then let me tell you this. You know, do not judge a party, ladies and gentlemen. Do not judge a party by what, it's, uh, what it says. Judge it by what it does. Now, around this country, we have now become, why, you might ask, we have become the second party of government. We've driven the Tories into third position. We now manage on your behalf 15 billion pounds of public funds. How have we done it? Because we have made promises that we have delivered, because people have trusted us, because they knew when we asked for more money, we spent it on where we said we'd spend it. 
And that's the reason why we've been elected for the government at local level. Now, I would like to do at national level Jamie. what we've already done at local level. Jamie and the Mother. proof of the pudding isn't in the words, it's in the actions on the ground. Okay. Point there. Don't I've read your policies. I've read your manifesto. Aren't you playing fantasy Jamie. politics with fantasy policies, bearing in mind the two-party system that you are, that you are sadly in? Damien, if you want to keep the two-party system, help yourself. Go on voting Labour, go on voting Conservatives. You'll have another 50 years of the division of our country between one and the other. The two-party system will maintain any new ideas, any new approach to politics, any idea that we'll bring some honesty back to our politics, any idea that we'll actually begin to plan for the long term rather than the short will have gone. Right. Now, if that's what you want to do, fine. Go on voting for it, that's what you'll get. But we offer a okay. different choice and okay. a different approach. We've to done that. Let, let's move, change the subject to tax. Terry O'Neill, I think, has a question on tax for us. Yes. Um, my interest really is in the uh, general direction of your policies, and it probably links with the earlier question about um, sharing of power. Um, five years ago, for example, you suggested uh, a rate of 50p on a salary of income of 50,000. Mm. You're now proposing uh, the same rate, 50p, on a threshold of 100,000. Mm. Does this illustrate a general convergence or move towards Labour policies? No, I, I have to say that Labour is not even prepared to offer that. They're not even prepared to raise the money that we will use to lift 500,000 out of the tax bracket altogether. But you cannot why have you get put more. yours up? Because we believed it right in the present economic circumstances. The well, you situation, don't, think, you don't think people over, earning over £50,000 uh, can... I'm can sorry, so the situation today is different than what it was five years ago. Therefore, I mean, you can't expect a party... Everything changes and you keep the policies the same. That really would be stupid. We have made a judgment that you will not kill enterprise in this country by putting tax on earnings of over £100,000 up to 50%. And incidentally, those who believe that that will drive enterprise away, taxes on... 50% in Germany, for instance, at about £46,000. We make a judgment on £100,000 of the fresh threshold. Labour, I'm afraid, haven't even managed to I'll try and come back to you, Mr. O'Neill, but just a gentleman there. Yes, just how annoyed and frustrated are you at the other two main parties coming into centre-ground politics? Well, I don't think they are. You see, the other two main parties have come into a position where they are both snuggled so closely together that many people can't tell the difference. But Neither then there's the whole them... left-hand side left free for you. I, I don't believe in the, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in the left, Sue, uh, and you know that. We stand four square where we've always been. I have not had to abandon every belief that I had, like the Labour Party, because it was out of date. Sorry, that was an 80-year-long mistake. We stand four square where we've always been. Okay, and I am determined that when we put forward policies Quick in this point. country, we will put forward honest policies, honestly right. costed, and that's the way Quick you know point. you can trust them. I think it's an overall um, situation. There is, no, uh, there is a sense that Lib Dem policies are moving, say, to the left of Labour. Uh, uh, it is absolutely wrong. If at the last election the Lib Dems were the sensible, practical, down-to-earth, and that's the way we've been. I mean, if you say we're left, is that the way we govern? Where you see a Lib Dem council in operation, is it left-wing? Is it radical? Does it, is it, does, it, does it take stupid decisions? No. It's elected more and more and increased majorities more and more as people like the kind of government that we've had. What you've got now is a kind of synchronised swimming in Britain. You've got the Tories and the Labour Party as close together as possible. Both of them offering nothing right. except promises they quick, can't deliver. Quick last I'm point from, from this gentleman, Mr Huns, down the front here. Yeah. I'm rather sceptical of your uh, tax rises and especially the one to put 5p on cigarettes. Mm -hmm. This would uh, apparently be asking us all to smoke ourselves to death to fund the health service. Quickly, no? if you would, because that's it. Uh, I, I, would have, I, would have, I would have thought the likelihood is if you put 5p on cigarettes, rather few of you will smoke. And that will help the health service. But look, the transfer is very but simple. But you need the money for the health service. Look, the transfer is very simple. We've already got uh, tax on cigarettes. The transfer is very simple. We want everybody in this country to have free eye and okay. dental checks. That's the basis of a preventative health service. In order to pay for that, we put 5p on a packet of cigarettes. If you don't think that's worth it, for free eye and dental checks for everybody in Britain, there's a very simple okay. answer. Don't vote for it. Mr Ashton, thank you very much. Two down, one to go. One to go. He's Tony Blair. We'll be back in a few moments.
and final part of this election campaign special. Now it's the turn of the Labour leader, Tony Blair, who, if elected on Thursday, will be the youngest Prime Minister this century. The ITV 500 is bubbling with questions for him, so let's take the first one, and that comes from Ken Lawford, who's a salesman from Bury in Lancashire. Hello, Mr Blair. Hello. Uh, what could you say uh, to thousands of people, like myself, who have always supported the Socialist Labour Party, but now feel drawn to the new... Um, the, the new ideas of the Liberal Democrat Party rather than your party. I think what I would say to you is this, that the changes that we have made in the Labour Party are not changes that in any way dismiss our essential values, the belief in a more just, more decent society, a fair deal for ordinary people, but we're trying to realise those values in a different world today. And I think the important thing for today's Labour Party, if we're elected, are not issues like nationalisation, or the old tax and spend agenda of the 60s and 70s. The issues today are things like education, you know, how we improve the skills of the population, how we build a modern industrial base. And so what I would say to you is that, you know, for all my adult life, people have been saying to me, it would be great to have a Labour Party that's electable, you know, that can actually win a general election and take power. Today we finally got one, and I hope people in the country rejoice about that rather than think there's something wrong in it. And I would also just say this to you. On Friday, you'll wake up either with a Conservative government or a Labour government, and if you want to get the Conservatives out, I ask you to support the Labour Party. Mr Lawford, when did you turn away from Labour? From old Labour? I think probably about the last six or seven months. Um, so it's his fault, is it? We, oh, yes, it is, Mr Blair's fault. <laughs> you see, they, they promised a lot of things, like when British Rail was nationalised, they promised to, re, to, to put it back into nationalisation, sorry. And, and I've not heard anything about that in your uh, proposals. Well, you have. You've decided not to do it after all. Yes, exactly. But, Mr Lawford, let me just explain to you why. Because the Conservatives have sold it, they've issued all the franchises, the money is now accounted for. Now, you see, it's all very well for the Lib Dems. They're not going to be in government. But if we're elected, we would be in government. And let me just explain to you the difficulty that we've got. Supposing you're sitting round that cabinet table and a thousand million pounds is there to be spent. How many people are going to say, spend that money on repurchasing share capital rather than spend it on the health service or education? Now, that's the choice in the real world that I face. Yes, but you knew 18 months ago. No, we didn't, see. Yes. No, I'm sorry, that was wrong. In fact... You the... knew that was what the plan was. When no. you said at the Labour Party conference of 95, you know, I say this, I want, the na I want British Rail in... Quite, in the but Sue, so at that point, it hadn't all been sold off and it hadn't been broken up. Now it has been. And you see, you take, for example, the water industry. We're in the same dilemma there. I didn't believe that privatising the water industry is sensible, but the money's been spent. And, and, you know, if in the end we're going to be genuinely honest with people, it's no use me saying that I can do something if in fact I know that the constraints of government are going to mean that I can't. And I, I hope very much that... And if you have supported the Labour Party all the way through, you do understand we are trying to remain true to our principles, but I only want to promise what I can genuinely deliver Stuart to Smith. people. Stuart Smith? Yes, uh, Mr Blair. I'm convinced yes. that you've been uh, modelled on a Trojan horse character, concealing all Labour's nasty people and policies inside. Yeah. You explain and confirm little, and you must have the most enormous pending tray in the world, with items including a real figure on the minimum wage, the future of child benefits on over 16s, corporal, corporation and capital gains tax, plus windfall tax. So, come on, get your cards on the table and give us some facts and figures. Yeah, yeah. You've U-turned on privatisation. <laughs> what will you privatise and what won't you privatise? Right. Cards right. on table. That's a Thank you. question. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. We'll put you down as a don't know, shall we? <laughs> 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 That's the old Tory propaganda. The windfall tax will be decided by the Chancellor in government, but the programme that it's going to fund is a £3 billion programme in order to take young people in particular, 250,000 of them, off benefit and into work. And I say this to you, there is a simple choice in this election. We either carry on with these levels of youth unemployment that I believe are totally unacceptable in a civilised society, or we but act. And his, that is the purpose of the windfall tax. Answer and the amount his question it, about what are you going to privatise or not, because the word privatisation does not appear in this manifesto. Well, actually, what we do say is that we will conduct an audit of all those assets that are in the public sector. There are lots of land and buildings that are there. And, for example, last year, we did not oppose, in principle, the sale, for example, of Ministry of Defence homes that have become vacant. We said that was right, we criticised the way that it was done, 
but the test should be the public interest, not dogma, the public interest. Big point back. The facts and figures is what we're looking for. You've dodged everything. Real figure right. on the minimum wage. There's so many people employed by small businesses that you could put on the streets with a ridiculous okay. level of minimum, minimum wage. Uh, but the way that we should determine a minimum wage is not for me to sit here as a politician and pluck a figure out of the air. If we did that, if you're a small business person, you'd be complaining. You'd say, I want to be consulted before you set a minimum wage. The process, therefore, of doing this is to say we should work with business and industry to set a figure that the economy can afford. That but should you've be had determined. 18 years no, to work one out. Sorry, Sue, that is ridiculous. Um, that is, with all due respect, ridiculous because it is surely more sensible to set a minimum wage according to the economic circumstances of the time when it is introduced. And that is precisely why what I have found with business and industry is that they say it is far better to consult us before setting it. And if I may just say to you, I think it is utterly unacceptable that you've got 800,000 people in this country paid below £2.50 an hour, and I don't think that is the way forward for Britain. So, so you, you think the minimum wage should be above £2.50 an hour. Will it be anything like the £4.26 that the TUC I've is I've said asking? to you already, it will be set in government and we will set it according to what the economy can afford. And I may just say this, every other major country in the Western world, including the United States of America, has a minimum wage. And people probably don't know this here, but as a result of low pay in this country, we now spend 3,000 million pounds every year subsidizing low pay. Two pence on the standard rate of income tax, I say that will money or some of it will be better used, invested in our public services. Gentlemen there. Yes, sir. Mr Blair, uh, one thing, I'm glad the audience has had the courtesy to listen to your answers rather than the yobs that were shouting the Deputy Prime Minister well, down earlier. Come on. Earlier, earlier today... No, I just had trouble with Sue, but I mean, you know, we'll sort that out. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Uh, earlier on, Mr Blair, you were talking about uh, the policies may have changed, but the principles mm -hmm. r remain there. For me, a party that... Uh, uh, someone that says they believe in, for example, nuclear disarmament, supporting the unions has completely different principles to one that stands up for privatisation, uh, lower, in, lower spending and lower taxation. I'll make it a question. I, yeah. I'd just like to know... I, I get the drift, don't worry. If, I, I get the drift. Right. Look, if, if I can just say to you again, you know, someone like yourself, with all due respect to you, is exactly the sort of person that 10 years or 15 years ago would have said to me, the Labour Party's too extreme, it's utterly unelectable, it's got a whole lot of outdated ideas, why don't you change them? When we do move with the times, modernise the Labour Party, get a decent forward-looking Labour Party, you say, how oh, terribly unprincipled, now you're electable. Now, I personally think it is not a sin to want to be elected, but the deal that we are offering people is precisely in line with the principles of the Labour Party. Let me give you a couple of examples. A national health service rebuilt as a proper national health service, not run like a supermarket. That's one thing that we can do. Let me give you another thing. Let me give you another thing. Reduced class sizes for all five, six and seven-year-olds in our primary schools to 30 or under, not spending that money, subsidising a few people in private education. Okay. That's a since you mentioned education, let me bring in Hilary Knight from Basildon. Hilary Knight, your question, please. Hilary. Hello. Mr Blair, how can you justify double standards within your party? Specifically, Harriet Harman choosing to send her child to grammar school and your children attend a grant-maintained selective school a long way from your home. When your policy is for comprehensive education, aren't you being a hypocrite? Yeah. No, I don't accept that at all. Children have gone across borough boundaries in London to church schools, which is where my child is going, uh, since time immemorial. They've done that under the last Labour government. They would do it under the next Labour government. And as for those people who send their children to grammar schools now, I don't believe in a return to the 11 plus, which is what the Conservatives want. I don't believe that. But we're not scrapping the grammar schools that remain. They should be allowed to remain. They're there. They enjoy parental support. They should be allowed to stay there. But the point but I is, would your just party say this didn't you. believe in selection, yes. and your child was selected, and Harriet no, Harman's was. And my I think child that people... actually goes. Sue, if I may just point out to you, my child goes to a church school in London, mm -hmm. and children have been going to that school. Yes from his earlier school since time immemorial. But they so select the Conservative... some and reject others, no, and you were no, interviewed it is not and selective... he was selected. Sorry, it is not a selective school. You are wrong. It is a state comprehensive school that happens to be a religious school. Now, that is You're a choice that parents... You're telling me they don't ever turn anybody away. That, that, 
Well, of course, they are oversubscribed because it is a good school. But that is so with many good state comprehensive schools. Now, if I may just say this to you, Sue, if I am elected as prime minister of this country, I will be the first serving British prime minister, the first who will have sent all his children to state schools. Not Mr. Major, me. This lady here, yeah? Um, can I ask you, um, Mr. Bayer, with all the corruption and all the sleaze that's gone on in the Conservative Party for the last five years, if you're, when you're in government, if your MPs behave the same way, will they be let off as the Conservatives have let off their people in their yeah. government? Um, no, if you're talking about uh, financial irregularities, no. If I believed that candidates of the Labour Party should stand down, I would have ensured that they did stand down. And I think it was quite wrong that the Conservatives wanted these candidates to stand down and then couldn't enforce it. And as for ministers, I can give you this absolute assurance. And this is what makes me angry in a way. After 18 years, all politicians get tarred with the same brush. We haven't been in power for 18 years. I can tell you if a minister of mine deliberately misleads the House of Commons, they will no longer be a minister. Full stop and period. Okay. Ivan Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ivan Norwich. Yeah. Sorry. Mr. Blair, you're very keen that we should trust you. Uh, it's been one of the basis of your campaign. And yet, with your, for example, your proposals on tax rates, you appear to be having a cynical attempt to mislead the whole of the electorate. Can you tell us how we can combine the two? What, do, what are you suspicious of? What do you think I'm you're suspicious going to do? Neither you, Gordon Brown, your local candidate, or any other spokesman I have discussed this with, appears willing to agree that you will also take corresponding moves with regard to thresholds, allowances, and other tax rates. Right. So you without might leave the two. Your, without which without your actual promise on basic and higher rates is completely meaningless in regard to the take-home pay of the individual. Well, I don't accept it's completely meaningless, but what I've said all the way through and what Gordon Brown has said, and entirely rightly, is that, that we can't start sitting and writing a budget now. Decisions have to be taken by chancellors in government according to the economic circumstances. What I can say to you, however, and this is the conservative charge, is that there are no hidden spending pledges that require hidden tax increases. On every occasion where we have said that we will spend money, for example, the windfall tax to fund the jobs program, for example, smaller class sizes, for example, cutting national health service waiting lists, uh, for example, uh, if there is a, um, the room for manoeuvre, a 10p starting rate of tax rather than the abolition of inheritance tax and but capital But are there gains hidden tax, tax increases? No, there really are no hidden tax question. increases. What I do are say to sure? people... Yes, I am sure about that, because the whole... You're not going to put any taxes up? No, so what I'm saying is there, are no, there is no programme that we have that is not properly costed. I cannot, neither can anyone, sit here and say that there are two to three hundred different allowances you know, over five years, this will be this, this will be that, and all the rest of it. You can't do that. But what you can do is say that where you are promising to spend money, you say exactly where that money comes from. Now, that is the most that you can reasonably expect, and we have done that, and we have done back, that very sir. clearly. The fact is, Mr. Blair, that if you knock the uh, threshold for, say, basic rate tax from the present 4,000 to 25,000 income back to, say, 2,000, that would have a significant effect upon the take-home pay of every person who is paying tax in this country. And therefore, the basic rate and the upper rate tax commitment that you have made is meaningless. Well, it isn't meaningless, but of course you're quite right in saying that there are other things and thresholds and allowances that so can affect So you might alter those. No, so I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that any programme that we have is properly costed. There's nothing in our programme that means we have to make those changes. But I'm not sitting here and writing a budget. No responsible politician can do that. If I may just point out to you, sir, on tax, since you talked about tax and cynicism, the most cynical act in the history of taxation was the Conservatives promising at the last election that they would cut taxes every okay. year and no, not put VAT on, 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 on fuel and then doing that precisely after you the election. You are promising something different, which we are not apparently well, going to get. You, thank you very much. I assume you'll be voting Labour then. Karen Palmer, where are you? There. Would you like to make a point on this? Yeah, Mr Blair, if you get voted into government on Thursday, would your so-called New Labour Party consider hiring tax for people that earn over £100,000 a year 
and giving it to people like me that are worse off. They have to bring up two children on £85 a week, allowed to work part-time, but only allowed to earn £15. Right. Would you consider doing that, Mr Blair? Uh, no, we've rejected that, but what we do have, though, is a programme to help people who are unemployed and would like to get better skills. But why can't you tax the rich to help these Because people? if you look back at what has happened in history, when you put up very high marginal rates of tax, what happens is those with the best accountants don't pay them. We're also in a competitive world economy today, and you have to remain competitive. And top rates of tax have come down the world over. What I would like to do, however, and this is the difference with the Conservatives, is that if there is the room for manoeuvre, I would like to have a 10 pence starting rate of tax, which but will help lower income earnings. That could well, be years away. Sue, it may be, but we will do our very best to achieve it, and it is a better option than ending but up with a set of tax proposals. But is it fair to be mentioning it tonight are... when it could be years and years no, away? No, it is fair to be mentioning it, with all due respect to you, because John Major is saying that if he's elected, he's going to uh, scrap inheritance tax and capital gains tax, and I'm saying if there is that room for manoeuvre there, let's help lower income earners for once rather than everyone at the top end of the market. Right, that's it. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Blair. That's it? That's it. That's it from the ITV 500 in the general election of 1997. You've uh, asked the questions, you've heard the answers. Now it's the politician's turn to wait for the only answer that really matters, the one which the electorate will deliver in three days' time. I'll be back at 10 o'clock on Thursday evening, that's polling day in case you didn't know, with members of the ITV 500 and Jonathan Dimbleby, Michael Brunson and Alistair Stewart, bringing you what we hope will be the fastest and uh, we certainly hope to be the friendliest anyway results of on television. So until Thursday at 10 o'clock from the ITV 500 and the three party leaders we've had here this evening, good night.